a good afternoon ladies and gentlemen how are you doing now l listen i know that it's friday afternoon if you're like me you're already counting down to the weekend but give me an hour before we officially shut off all right so um you're going to please engage with me in the comment section so that i can see you and make sure that you're here and you're not using me to go and you know make lunch okay <laughs> <laughs> All right, awesome. Um, I'm going to share my screen and then we're going to get right started, uh, started right off. So today's class, and just let me know as soon as you can see my screen, because Teams is doing the most. Hmm. And those of us that are in the market, please mute yourself while you are pricing what you are pricing in the market. All right, let me know if you can see my screen. You can see it. Thank you, Adeyemi. All right. Thank you, Ibu Kunalua. Yay, Israel. It's a pleasure to be here as well. All right. So adaptability and resilience. And if you see me looking this way, it's because I have a big screen here that has my presentation. So I'll be referring to it um, periodically, but I am right here with you. Okay. So let's just move and start the conversation of today. Now, I know that my bio was read and graciously read my bio, but I like introducing myself in different ways, depending on the audience of who I'm speaking to. So, yes, um, you, you heard it. I'm the head of portfolio here at Pen Ricard. Uh, I've been in the corporate space for a little over two decades. I can't even believe it myself. I don't know where the time has gone. Uh, and I've worked primarily in Nigeria, but overseeing several uh, African countries. So I think the first time I started doing some things in African countries was um, in 2010 or so. I set up a few businesses in Ghana and in Cameroon for my company at the time. And up until December in this role, I was overseeing six other Western African countries. So we are, we've been around in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so all of that is in interesting. But for today, I want to describe myself by saying first that, you know, I'm an elegant infusion of light into my world. And I always like describing myself in a way that speaks to purpose. And I know we're talking about adaptability and resilience, so just stay with me for a minute, okay? I'm an elegant infusion of light into my world. But before I got here, it started off by being an engineer. So I have a first degree in electronics engineering. Do I have any electronics engineers in the house? Let me know in the comment section if I have electronics engineers or um, electrical electronic engineers, let me know. And then I have a master's degree in mobile and satellite communications. So by my heritage, by my training, I'm a core engineer. So that's where I started off. I moved back to Nigeria the first time in 2006. I worked with Huawei Technologies for maybe four years or so. Etisalat wasn't in Nigeria at the time. So I was overseeing that project as a, an assistant commercial engineer. So we'll go to this, you know, sites and pick the sites for the mast and all of those things was what I was doing in the first, the first few years of my career. And it was beautiful. And then I knew I was going to go away to do my master's. And then I was thinking, what else am I going to do in between? And for almost a year, I worked with the Lagos Business School as a program coordinator. Okay. And uh, in that role, I was overseeing and managing the executive program. So they're high end executive people. I would organize the whole programs, you know, and everything, everything. So that was that was that I did that for about a year. I came back to Nigeria second time in 2011, I think it was, I can't remember the year. And I did business development. So I managed business development for a company still in the tech space, but around value added services. And it was with this organization that, you know, I started off the, the business relationships across Nigeria and then also in, in Ghana, in Cameroon. And then I started in South Africa just before I, I left the organization. And then Diageo came calling, they knocked on the door and they said, come on over, we're starting a business within a business. And I moved to Diageo in 2014 and, um, you know, marketing and sales was where it is that I went. And I've said all of this to say, when we talk about adaptability and resilience, it's not just in how you are, it's all, it can also be your career journey. As you can see in my own story, I've had to 
adapt multiple times and find new ways of myself across each of each of the ways. Yeah. I am also a, a former beauty queen. So in 2005, I believe it was, I was crowned, um, well, I won a beauty pageant in the UK and I did that for one year. Simultaneously, I was also the secretary. So I campaigned, it was not a, an appointed position. I went all over campus, I campaigned and uh, I was elected uh, as the secretary of the Reading University Afro-Caribbean Society, which was the second biggest society in my university at the time. So leadership right? Evolving into different phases of leadership alongside my education is also another thing about the adaptability and resilience. And then in my everyday life today, yeah, I'm here leading a portfolio of about eight brands. I'm a volunteer to certain other organizations. I'm a mentor. I'm a coach. I'm an author. I'm a teacher. And being able to do all of this without dropping the ball is why we have the conversations about adaptability and resilience. Okay. So why is this conversation necessary? You know, I know you're all in this program. You guys started off almost uh, 200 people. Today, about 30 people in. And when my sis was telling me the various modalities of how it happens, I was just like, my goodness. <laughs> it's strict and, and it's so well put together and, you know, well done to all the organizers, really. But why is this conversation necessary as we think about it? It's really necessary because when you think of the space that we're in, the dynamics of the um, STEM landscape, the dynamics of the energy landscape, there are certain things that if we're not careful about, we would almost literally drown. Okay, and I'm going to take us through a couple of these things. First off is technology, um, technological growth, right? And when we think, okay, what's technological growth? What does it really mean um, in life? I think one or two things to think about. Nigeria is one of the places that's at the technological forefront of innovation in Africa today. We have a booming tech industry. Somebody in my office resigned about, you know, three or four months ago. And he's like, listen, Lady B, I have this tech, whatever that's bringing me. I don't know how many millions of Naira each, each um, month I'm going to go. So we have this booming tech industry that includes advancements in fintech. We have mobile tech. We have e-commerce, all of this. It's a dynamic, ever-changing landscape. We have this whole renewable energy potential and a lot of governments, a lot of businesses are leaning towards this in the sense of we have this abundant sunlight. We have this fantastic wind resources. You know, how can we invest as a nation in renewable energy uh, projects so that we're creating sustainable and affordable energy solutions? This is the question on the heart of a number of organizations and the question on the heart of our governments. And what this means is that there will be new opportunities that will open up in the areas of green technology in the days to come. Can someone help me meet? Thank you. In the days and, um, and the weeks and the months and the years ahead. And then there's this whole startup ecosystem. And this one excites me because in places like Lagos, in places like Abuja, in places like Port Harcourt, even because I do some work, um, you know, I travel across Nigeria, Port Harcourt, all of that. There are these vibrant startup hubs that offer so many opportunities for young entrepreneurs, young innovators like you to launch and grow STEM focused ventures, right? All of this is the dynamism of where we are. And I know that there's a narrative today that's like, oh, the nation is X, Y, Z and whatever it is. But there is good news because there's so much opportunity and there's so much dynamism that's happening. We can take advantage. Let's look at a couple more. So we have the government policies and we have all the regulations of all the things that's happening. Now, the government, the Nigerian government in particular, is trying to implement a number of policies that can enhance STEM education and enhance research in this area. You know, there's some scholarships, some funding programs that are aimed at supporting the next generation of Nigerian scientists, engineers, you know, medical personnel, all of that. So there is something again there. The landscape is shifting and changing every day. OK. Infrastructure investments, significant investments are being made to improve our infrastructure, whether it's the expansion of internet connectivity before and before not too long ago, we just had maybe a couple, 
maybe there was a is it swift or you know one or two of these ones then fiber one came and it seemed like fiber one was shifting the entire game and then after fiber one we have this one that's just come um a few weeks a few months ago whatever it is i've forgotten the name of this one the global one that's coming right but there's a lot of investment being made um, because opportunity is, is being recognized. In our transportation networks, look at the blue line in Lagos, the railway that goes from um, um, Abuja all the way, I think, to Kaduna or something. I mean, there is a lot. The, the line that goes from Lagos through the west, so Lagos, Abiyakuta, Ibadan, all of that. Transportation networks are expanding and it's still going a lot further right power supply is not as great as it should be but the eyes on that to also ask the question of how can this become better and all of these things are crucial for stem growth okay and then the final thing i'm going to say is about the youth driven innovation one of the biggest blessings of a nation is the population of youth and when you talk about africa and when you talk about Nigeria, one of our biggest blessings is that majority of our youth is actually, majority of our population is actually under the 25 year old um, ratio. It is unseen or unheard of in most developing nations across the world. Europe has a dying population in the sense that what I mean is that they have more older people than they have younger people. You name it, China is battling with it after the one child policy, all of the things, the aftermath of that, they're realizing, hey, we need to encourage people to give birth to kids so that we can ensure the continuity of our line. In Africa, that's not our issue at all. But what is even more beautiful with the youth that we have is this thing of youth driven innovation, because our young people are actually very enterprising. And because young people can see possibilities, a lot of the things are coming up from here. Whether it's that they're pursuing degrees in science, in, in tech, and in all of these things, and offering numerous um, opportunities just to drive innovation in general. Maybe what a, a former person, if you know an older person might use three days, or let me carry this and put it here. A younger person may be like, ah, instead of just carrying this thing and put it here, what about if I create something that's innovation? And it's mind blowing. So when you think about the dynamics of how our um, landscape is here, in the midst of chaos, sometimes there can be great opportunity. In the midst of disruption, wise people that are able to look and understand the times and seasons are able to quickly adapt and posture can come out with really great um you know, can be positioned rather for really great success in the midst of disruption. Okay. Let me know if you're still with me in the comment section. Just say, Lady Bodam, I'm still with you. Keep going. Let me know. I won't keep going if you don't tell me you're still with me. So tell me, Lady Bodam, I'm still with you. Keep going. I'm still with you. Keep going. Talk to me. Talk to me. Okay. Fantastic. Adeyemi is still with me. Okay. Where are my other people? You're still with me. Oh, thank you. Okay. My gentlemen are still with me. I need one lady that tells me, Lady Bodam, I'm still with you. Keep going. Keep going. All right. Okay. So what does this really mean for you? I've spoken about the, the nature of the dynamism. I've spoken about all of that. What does it actually mean for you? Aisha, thank you. Me. Okay. You're still with me. Awesome. What does it mean for you? If there's nothing else you take out of today, I want you to imprint this image in your mind. This image that shows adaptability, resilience, and calls it adaptable resilience. Everything else we're gonna speak about over the next few minutes falls, rises and falls on this image. Okay, adaptability and resilience. Now, the power of adaptability, and I'm going to spend the next few minutes speaking about that. Then I'll speak about resilience and we'll tie it all together. So what is adaptability? If you think about it, it's the ability to adjust. And I saw someone put something like that in the comment section earlier. It's the ability to adjust to new conditions and changes in the environment. Have we not had to adjust? A bag of rice was how much before? 
Now the bag of rice is what it is. One dollar was whatever it is before. Now one dollar is whatever it is. A bag of beans was I don't know what before. Now we know what a bag of beans is. But let me not even go to all these big, big things. A crate of egg. <laughs> a crate of egg was how much before. And now we know how much a crate of egg is. The ability to adjust to new conditions and changes in the environment is the definition of adaptability. So what are some of the key components of adaptability? Flexibility. This one is a big deal. And what this means in essence is that you cannot be fixated on any one way of doing things. You must be able to recognize when things in the environment are changing and quickly begin to ask yourself, how, what am I going to do in response to the things that are changing? So flexibility is a big deal when we talk about adaptability. The second big thing is resilience. Now, resilience, I'm not going to speak about here because we're going to speak about it in a whole other section. The third is actually being open to new ideas. If you want to go far, if you want to be postured for the long haul, you cannot ever be caught saying, this is how things are. I was having a conversation in the office um, just a few, maybe last week, and somebody was, you know, in my commercial team was saying, oh, so I was talking to someone in finance and said, you guys are coming. We've always done it this way. And you guys have brought all these extra things that are so complicated and on and on and on. And I just said, you know, this statement you've made that we've always done things this way. If it's not broken, we don't need to fix it. That's probably what Nokia said. And where, who, how many of us have a Nokia phone? today that's probably what blackberry blackberry said that hey we don't need to switch we don't need to upgrade it's not broken so there's no need to fix it that's probably what even landlines said that what kind of world would it be if people are talking where they are no now you sit in your home to make a conversation it's not broke we don't need to fix it that's probably what record players said then CDs said the same thing. Now you can walk around with a mobile phone and you have access to thousands of songs in one place. Look at that. Openness to new ideas is what sets leaders, sets really phenomenal people apart from everybody else. And very closely linked to that will be problem solving skills in the sense that you always have to have a lens of you don't come with problems to people. You don't come with, oh, Lady Bodham, the water is not running. Okay. There's a song that comes to say, Lady Bodham, the water wasn't running an hour ago. I've contacted the plumber. He's coming to, you know, uncover what, what. Then he said this. Then come with solutions. The difference between a vast number of people in our world today are that those who are solution-oriented, those who are problem-solving oriented are those who stand out and are set apart and are picked for certain opportunities. Right? So why is it important? We've spoken about what it is. We've spoken about its definition. We've spoken about, you know, all of these type of things. Now, why is adaptability important? I love that, Victor. Victor says openness paves the way for intersectional innovation and breakthrough innovation. Exactly. If you're not open to new ideas, there's no way you can be innovative. I love it. Yeah. So why is it important? We've spoken about rapid technological advancements. First of all, you have to stay current with new technologies, new innovation, especially in the industry that we're in. Right. There's an evolving job market. There are shifts in job rules. I took you through my journey. I started off as an assistant commercial engineer. Today, I'm building multinational brands. That might not be everybody's story, but we have to realize that the job market is evolving. What does this also mean? A few years ago, the idea of working remotely for some people would have been like heaven will fall and the skies will, I don't know what. Then COVID-19 pandemic came. And 2020, the world shut down. The organization I was working with at the time, that was our best year ever over the last like 30 or 40 years. Best year ever. A year that the world shut down. I was stuck in the United Kingdom for about eight months. 
um, because I went just before and then everything shut down. So I was there about seven or eight months or so, still doing a full-time job, wrote a book in that period, published it in that period. Why? We need to understand the navigating shifts in job roles, the navigating shifts in industry demands. And this very closely links that you have to be self-regulated as a person, but maybe we'll talk about that later. The third big thing is globalization. We are getting smaller. The world is getting smaller and smaller. So you can say, oh, that's how we do it in my village. I'm from Obomosho, and in Obomosho, that's how we do it in my village. So I always like to say fun fact, right? Now, by heritage, I am Yoruba. So my dad is from Ocean States. So I'm a Yoruba girl by Nigerian um, standards. My mom is from uh, Crossover. So I'm from, uh, I'm half from Northern Crossover, Boki over there, right? So I'm Yoruba on this side, I'm Crossover on this side. And then I was born in um, Plateau States. So I claim a little bit of the North as well. Born in Joss. I spent the first few years of my life in, in Joss. I believe I moved to Lagos, you know, when I was eight or nine or something like that. So I've done three parts of the four um, parts of Nigeria in, in a sense. Well, we're six, but I'm just going to for the purpose. So I now need to find something that will connect me to the East. So that when I'm telling this story, I can be like, you know, the West on this side, the South, South on this side, the North on this side, and then the East on this side. But I've visited many, many cities in the East, gone for many, many weddings, many, many funerals, and so many other things. I just thought that's just a joke. And why am I saying this though? It's a tie to this thing of globalization. There's someone whose mic is, is unmuted. If you could please, um, I can't see it on here. If not, I would mute. Okay. Thank you. So, um, you know, we're talking about this thing of globalization. You can't, I can't sit here comfortably and say, you know what? That's how we do it in Oshun State too. Because that's how we do Or that's how I was born in the North. That's how we do it in, in Joss. If it's not like that, then no. Or, you know, my mother's people. <clears throat> It's beyond Nigeria. It's beyond your village. It's beyond Nigeria. It's even beyond Africa. You have to realize we're living now in a global world. How can you adapt to different cultures and attract and adapt global business practices? There are certain things that cut across culture. Number one is honor. And I really love what my sister Tumbaso said when she came on here. She's like, you know, one of the things she t they teach on here is honor. It is, it, it's honor goes beyond for some people. Yes, maybe they do the namaste to, to honor for maybe someone from Japan or Asia. They might bow, you know, from the waist down. Maybe the, the people from the Western parts of Nigeria may go on their knees. The people from the Northern um, parts of Nigeria sometimes go on their knees or sometimes maybe they, they lie or whatever. People from the Eastern parts of Nigeria will just bend slightly. So many different things. Some people do, I mean, so many things, but what is universal is honor. Another thing that's universal is excellence. Everybody recognizes excellence. Everybody is a universal language. So how can you adapt to different cultures, adapt to different global practices? The third thing why adaptability is important, or the fourth thing rather, is we're living in a world of uncertainty and change. There's unpredictability in projects, unpredictability in, in careers, Right, I mentioned to you that up until December, I was managing six um, six countries across Western Africa. Towards the end of last year, we made the difficult decision of closing down Ghana. Imagine me sitting with my team of, of you know girls and and gentlemen to say, "Look, this business is closing down." That's a hard conversation. I'm now saying, "All right, what what? Yes, closing down. Okay, it's, but it's not the end of the world." What skill sets do you have? How can we adapt? How can we pivot quickly? We all live in, an, in a world of uncertainty and change. If you're not able to adapt very quickly, you're going to die of along the wayside, right? And not physically die, but just along the wayside. A few more things to think about. Technological innovation, I've said this as well. There are constant updates constant new discoveries you can't just be stuck on you know it might is is what they taught me in university that's all i'm going to mm -mm. 
What is the way that you get, what's your access point of um, uh, news when it comes to, <laughs> Sarah, thank you. What's your access point of news when it comes to technological innovation for your own space? What's going on in the medical field? What are the new inventions, the new in equipment, the new uh, practices, the new pro procedures, the new processes in the medical field? What's the new um, thing in, in electricity, in energy, in energy? What is new in your area? What's your way of getting that information? The other reason why adaptability is important, especially as you proceed outside of the university, is this one interdisciplinary collaboration. Why? You will not always work with people in STEM. Today, I work with commercial, I work with finance, I work with um, uh, operations, I work with supply, I work with human resources, I work with, uh, you name it, I've probably worked with it. I work with lawyers, I work with, I don't know, also agency partners, artisans, everybody. Question. How can you collaborate when you speak different languages? How can you collaborate when you have different backgrounds? How can you communicate what you want? How can you draw people together to achieve a common goal when you even view the problem differently? That's the, that's the goal of adaptability. I'm going to move on real quick. Continuous learning. This one is a biggie. I've said it already. You have to keep on growing and evolving as a person. And the very fifth one, keep your knowledge, your skills up to date. And that's your personal responsibility. I like to tell people every time I'm in a room, I have the opportunity and the privilege to speak to people. I like to say that you are the CEO of the institution that is called Bellumi Incorporated. You are the CEO. And it is your responsibility to decide how your shares will grow each year. It's your responsibility to decide how you will, how you would evolve each year. It's your responsibility to realize, to decide the value that you're going to increase in each year. Nobody can do that for you. And that's what this continuous learning pillar is about. When you evaluate yourself at the beginning of the year, you can't be the same person in January. Than you, that, that you are in July, that you are in December, then that year might as well not have existed. Right? You're the CEO of your institution that is called yourself. So you have to grow. And the last thing on this is problem solving. And we mentioned this earlier. You have to tackle complex unforeseen challenges and um, adaptability will help you do that. So we've said all of this stuff. So what does it actually mean? Now what? First is really to, to learn to embrace change and to stay agile. There are a few things to think about. I've mentioned a couple. To stay informed. Industry news with trends, with advancements, to actively seek feedback. Seek feedback based on your actions. Ask people for how you're doing. Should I tell you something I do at the end of each year? If you want me to tell you, put it in the comment section for me. And I see you guys in the comment section, okay? Let me know if you want me to tell you what I do at the end of each year. And this is my way of making sure you're still awake. Adeya, me, thank you. I'm glad that the explanation on certainty and change hits you. I should tell you, Bukunulua, tell your colleagues to let me tell you as well. You love to know. Okay. So at the end of each year, and I've been doing this, the only year I didn't do this was last year because of certain circumstances. But before last year, I've done this for about maybe four years or so. I create a Google form, right? A Google form, and I ask different questions. Um, tell me what you think I should, you know, what my great strengths are. Tell me areas you want me to improve. Tell me what you're proud about, you know, of what I did in this year. Tell me an area that you want to see me do more of. Just this Google form with different questions about, you know, about me. Then I send this form out to no less than 20 people. I send it to some members of my team that I work with in the organization. I send it to some of my friends. I send it to some mentors. I send it to co-laborers, people that I've done work with in the vision. I send it to people that I've served. I send it to people that serve me, right? So I just put it out there and I take all the information. I give them a deadline, ask them nicely, give them a deadline. And the majority of them give me the deadline. 
send it to colleagues in my office, to peers in my office, send it to them. And when all the information comes back, I now sit with it and ask myself, what have you done good this year? I keep it. What areas do you need to improve this year? What do, what do people want you to see more? Because we don't know everything about ourselves. What, what do you think people should, what do people say you should do more of? If things are, 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 being, are showing up, you ask five people and people are like, you're impatient, you're impatient, you're impatient. You can't be like, I don't know, maybe they don't, don't understand me. I'm not, I'm really a patient person. Mm -mm. But it's your responsibility to seek feedback. Hmm. Daniel, I believe if you have a Google account, uh, if you have a Gmail account, actually, you can create a Google form. And if you just go on Google and type, how can I create a Google form? It will walk you through the process of creating a Google form. But first off, you, if I'm not mistaken, you do need a Gmail account. So you can set up Daniel Ugueze at gmail.com and you have access to a lot of the, the tools on Google. Third thing is to constantly experiment and innovate. Be willing to try new methods, be willing to try new ideas. Don't be so afraid of failure. And then network and collaboration is a big deal as well. So engage with pairs and professionals in your field. Who are you talking to other than those that are just around you? Who are you talking to? How are you expanding your knowledge base and all of this, right? A few other things to think about, I wrote here that, wait, there's a little bit more. And there's a little bit more because when it comes to changing and staying agile, I want you to think of this thing of continuous learning. I know we spoke about this earlier, but take um, online courses, attend workshops, read industry publications. Don't tell me, Lady Buddha, you know, I don't have money. YouTube is a vast university all on its own vast university pending when you can start paying can you at least create a curriculum for yourself with free there's youtube there's coursera there's udemy some of those things are are paid but there's also a large library of things that are free it just takes a little bit of intentionality a little bit of deliberateness you have to diversify your skill beyond your core expertise and this is what i do in all these things are the things of adaptability I know you've had a course where you've had one of those sessions that spoke about pro uh, time management. So I'm not going to speak to this one, but it's about prioritizing your, your task effectively and then adapting to tools and technologies, quickly learning new software, quickly learning new tools and all of this. So what are all these things that I'm telling to you? What am I saying? I'm saying you have to have a growth mindset. Adaptability cannot exist if you don't have a growth mindset. And this beautiful image that I found on here really speaks to what a growth mindset. There's this woman, her name is Carol Dweck, and she's done a lot of research on the mind. And she's one of the first people that first came out to say, look, that our minds are not um, fixed. Our minds, you know, before it's like, ah, this person is smart, this person is smart, this person is not smart, too bad. But she came out to say how Look, this is, this is not, this is not how things are. You can teach your mind anything. That's the beauty about having a growth mindset. A growth mindset says, um, I can learn to do anything I want. Listen, if you get this thing, your life would, would radically transform. That there is nothing that is beyond your ability to learn. It's not that, it's just a knowledge gap. Is to say that, oh, I see this person. I'm not like, hey, God, when am I ever getting to do this? You're inspired by the success of others. Your feedback, you take feedback as a constructive way of evolving. That your efforts and your atti um, um, attitude ultimately will determine your abilities. And that failure, or this thing we call failure, is an opportunity to grow. That's a growth mindset. In essence, your abilities, your intelligence can be um, can, can be developed through dedication and hard work. That's liberating. That means if there's something you don't know today, all it is is that you don't know it today. Tomorrow you might know it. Next tomorrow you can know it. It means almost like, yes, there are some people that are gifted and I'm not taking that away. But there are some people that have put in sheer hard work and it's this thing of having a growth mindset. So what does a growth mindset in action actually really look like? 
<laughs> I will just um, take that real quick. First up is that there are steps. There are steps that you have to build. First is you embrace challenges. Challenges are an opportunity to grow. Right, you learn from your mistakes. Failure is a learning experience. All of this is all under adaptability. You cultivate curiosity in the sense that you're always curious and eager to learn. And then you set goals, and we don't say this enough. What are your short term goals? What are your long term goals? What are you striving? If I tell somebody to meet now, tell me what you want to achieve. Three things you want to achieve between now and the end of December. What would you tell me? And your goals have to be so crystal clear right there in front of your face that you're reviewing every day that you can say. If you ask me what are three things you want to achieve before the end of December, I can tell you. One, I want to get accepted um, into my PhD program. Second is I want to release um, at least one book, but if I'm disciplined enough, two other books by the end of the year. And third is that I want to launch my membership club for female leaders. I can give you a few more, but since I said three, let's stick with three. If you don't even have three, what is your one goal between now and the end of the year? What are you working towards? Continuous improvement. You always have to look for ways to innovate. This was great, but can it be done better? How can you collaborate and work effectively with teams? How can you learn from pairs? This is a big deal, especially as you get into the real world. Resilience, bounce back from setbacks. Keep pushing forward. And we're going to talk about this one. And of course, being open to new ideas and changes in your field, right? So a few things, all these things we've been talking about lead into resilience. I know what I find really beautiful or really interesting is that you can't talk about adaptability without speaking about resilience and you can't speak about resilience without speaking about adaptability. And in this world, I was having a conversation with a team member about three months ago and she was telling me, oh, you know, um, but um, there are some things I'm just going to check out of because the stress is just too much. But this is too much. I'm just going to, you know, to protect myself. I'm just going to take a few steps. And I told her then, and I'm going to tell you now, that what I'm about to say might sound a little bit countercultural or counter what is the accepted norm. But stay with me a little. What I find, I work a lot now with younger people, so people in their 20s. And, and what I find is that a lot of the time, people in their 20s are quicker to drop the ball, in pro to step away from certain things, to protect themselves. But there are some things, and I can tell you this by, according to theory, I can tell you this by research, and I can tell you this experiential. There are certain things that you need to push through to get to the other side. If you don't have this skill of resilience, there are many opportunities that you will walk away from because it's too hard. There are many relationships you will not get the true value out of because they're difficult. There are some people that you will work with and you would really think to yourself that this employer is a witch. <clears throat> or a wizard. But all you're meant to learn in that thing is heightened, elevated levels of excellence. And maybe you are meant to learn that lesson in six months. But after six weeks, you're like, look, listen, I'm not here for anybody to just make me feel some kind of way. I'm just going to walk away. We abdicate process too early. And as we begin to talk about resilience over the next few slides, I really want that to just land with you, this thing of process and what we can get out of it. Resilience is your capacity to quickly recover from difficulties and to adapt well in the face of adversity, trauma or significant stress. Quickly recover, adapt well. We will all have stress at one point in time. We will all have difficulties. We will face adversity. We will face trauma. We will face challenges in one form or the other. The question is, how can you recover quickly and how can you adapt well? And then some of the key components to think about would be, first off, emotional strength. And we'll talk about these things. Second thing is mental toughness. You cannot be lily livered. You can't be wishy-washy. Tossed to and fro by the, by the wind. They said one thing to me, hey, who is me? Oh, that's the end of the story. That can't be you. You have to have a mental fortitude. 
right? We've spoken about adaptability earlier on, and we'll speak to this. And the fourth one is persistence. What is persistence? Persistence means that you've seen a, a, an outcome. You've seen something that you want to get to. And every day, you go after that thing with single-minded focus. It's like this story, I'm sure you've heard the story, of when water is, is being dripped on a rock. And that water will be dripped on the rock, dripped on the rock, and then there will come a point where after years of that drop of water, the rock actually breaks in two. It's not strength of the rock, of the water rather. It's not the force of the water. It's the persistency and the consistency of the water. So how persistent are you in going after what it is that you want? And why is resilience important? One, it helps us overcome obstacles. It helps you bounce back from setbacks and failures, and there'll be a lot. It's essential for mental and emotional health. This pandemic we have in Africa, of the mental health challenges people are going through, it's because we're lacking in resilience, and that's a big deal. It's key to sustain performance, to endure stress, to maintain productivity, and maybe not even like unhealthy stress. There's, let me give you an example of healthy stress. Tomorrow I'm hosting a summit for female leaders, right? And I've been preparing for that for a while. Today I'm teaching this session. I also had to prepare for this. Yesterday I was teaching at another place. I also had to prepare for that. Bear in mind, I have a full-time job. <laughs> I have my nieces, my parents, I have family members, my siblings that I want to connect with, right? So then this morning, I'm hearing the flight from Abuja that was meant to come. It can't come again. One thing has been canceled and I don't know what, and I don't know what that's bringing one of my speakers. If I don't have resilience, I will just be like, this thing is too hard. I don't know if I want to do it again. But it's essential that I do it. So it's key. Resilience is key to sustaining, uh, uh, maintaining productivity and enduring stress. It facilitates your personal and professional growth. If you're doing exercise, if you're intending on growing yourself in your, in your career, you need resilience to stick the course. It helps us handle failure which is critical as experimental failure, your project sets back, you didn't get the grade or the score that you want, whatever it is, you need resilience to push through. It helps us to adapt to change, right? It helps us maintain motivation and focus over a long period. You cannot get through long-term projects without resilience. And it helps us collaborate with others. It helps us navigate all the interpersonal dynamics in team settings. And if you work in a team, you will rub people off the wrong way and they will equally rub you off the wrong way as well. The question is, do you have the resilience to navigate through the interpersonal challenges um, in team settings? So what are some of the ways we can cultivate resilience in ourselves and in others? The first thing is to set realistic goals. You have to break down larger tasks into manageable steps right? so you don't feel overwhelmed. Surround yourself with pairs and with mentors, supportive pairs and mentors. Look, this one, if you're able to develop a support network that, that, that is the biggest thing, is one of the biggest things, is what will pull you through on days when you're like, I'm not going to get out of bed. You have to have a network. And now is the time to begin to develop the network. It's not when you become CEO that you start developing your network. You want people that are in your corner. You want people that have your back. You want people that are telling you that, see, and, and look, before you tell me, oh, Lady B, you don't understand people, people are wicked, people are, I know that's the reality of some people, but I don't even expect to receive the wickedness of people, so those people don't come into my life. I don't have relationships that have drama. I'm too busy. One of my coaches will say, destiny distracts from, drama distracts from destiny, and I agree. I'm too destiny focused to be surrounding myself with one sister that would gossip one brother. That's lower level thinking. And if those are the circles you're in, quick, you look for how to pivot to those conversations. You look for how to adapt those relationships into destiny type of relationships, right? Stay positive. We'll speak about this one a, a, a bit and then practice self-care. Okay, I'm going to move real quick now. 
Leaning closely into this idea of resilience is emotional intelligence. And there are four pillars of emotional intelligence. We're still speaking about how to build resilience. You said, you know, set realistic goals. You build a support network. You're staying positive. You're focusing and practicing on self-care. The second thing is learning how to understand and manage your emotions. And this is where emotional intelligence comes in. So the first thing is self-awareness. Do you know yourself? Do you know what makes you tick and what makes you not tick? Do you recognize your emotions? I was in a session once with this amazing neurosurgeon, uh, Dr. Ni Borore. He's a fantastic, when he speaks about the brain, my goodness, I almost feel like going back to school to study medicine. And I was in a session with him and he was saying how we need to learn to name our emotions. So if you're angry, call it what it is. I'm angry. I'm upset. I'm sad. I'm tired. I'm a little discouraged. A lot of the time, especially depending on the faith you're of, and I know we have people of all sorts, like, how are you? It is well. How are you feeling? I heard you are not feeling well. How are you? I'm strong. And I'm not saying don't let your faith work for you. If that's your thing, go for it. But you need to be able to recognize the truth of your emotions and understand how they're influencing your actions because they are. The second big pillar is you need to now learn how to regulate. You cannot regulate what you've not acknowledged. You can't regulate what does not have a name. So if you are angry, you now know, okay, when person A does this thing, I get upset. When Bosayo shows up in this way, it really ticks me off. You know, because you are aware. The question now is, how can you manage the, the emotions in a way that is healthy? How can you now adapt to changing circumstances? Right? The third thing is on empathy which is how do you now understand the emotions of other people? You know, sometimes we step into a room and there's such a thing as reading the room. How are we reading the room? Right? And then the fourth thing is in terms of our social skills. Are we building and maintaining relationships, effective communication, all of that? And these are all pivotal things um, when it comes to Pivotal things when it comes to learning how to manage our emotions. Okay. Now, for the days life gets stressful and life will get stressful, you need to develop healthy coping mechanisms. So one of it is mindfulness and meditation. And essentially, this is just silence in error. Creating moments of silence so that you can listen to yourself, listen to your mind, listen to your emotions, listen to your worries, listen to your fears, listen to you. I'm not saying spend time on Netflix. I'm not saying spend time on YouTube. I'm not saying spend time watching Africa magic or watching I don't know what it is you watch. And that's what I'm saying. Spend time listening to you and your heart. That's the first big pillar, mindfulness and meditation. The second thing is physical activity. And all the studies have shown that one way of coping with stress, reducing stress and building resilience is this thing of physical activity, right? The third big thing is finding creative outlets, engage in hobbies and activities that bring you joy and relaxation. Um, for me, I play with my, sometimes I go and play with my nieces. Um, you know, I just go, I don't really tell my sister, I'm like, I'm coming to your house. I will go and I will just sit on the floor with my nieces and I will play with them and they would, you know, love up on me and I will love up on them. And it just gives me such an outlet. It brings me joy and relaxed. Seek professional help if necessary. And we don't speak to this one as often. If you're, if you cannot cope, if you find you've reached a level where, look, this, my resilience is not resilient. Look for professional help. Get a counselor, get a teacher, get a, 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 you know, get therapy, whatever you need, or seek professional help if necessary. So how can you manage stress? I'm going to give you four things. First off is recognize what triggers your stress. Is it a person? Is it a place? Is it a situation? Some people are triggered by lack of money. I understand. Some of us are triggered when we're disrespected. 
some of us are triggered when you know we can't really prioritize our work what triggers you the second big thing is understanding how to manage your time and i know you spoke to this a few weeks ago so how do you organize and prioritize your task effectively the third is infusing relaxation techniques in your everyday routines. So sometimes, depending on how things are here, I just stop, I close my eyes, and I just take a few deep breaths. I just tell myself, don't worry, but you can do this just a little bit more. Well done. Find those moments, those relaxation techniques, what work for you. And then avoid overwhelm by breaking down your big tasks into smaller bite-sized pieces. So maybe you've not been able to build the tower in the sky, but did you at least call the bricklayer and tell him, today will make one brick for me. That's a step. It stops you from feeling overwhelmed and it helps you manage stress, okay? Third, second thing is positive thinking. And um, maybe I'll share two or three things over here. The first thing I need about positive thinking is to refrain negative thoughts. So you can say, oh, um, I don't have money. I do never have, will I ever have money in this life? Money there. But you can say, I might not have money yet. Going back to this growth mindset thing, you can learn anything. You can evolve anything, anything. You can drastically change the outcome of your life. If you didn't come from a certain kind of family, a certain kind of family can come from you. Nothing is, a, is written, but you have to, it starts from your thoughts. You have to reframe your thoughts. One of my uh, mentors or teachers that I listen to says this a lot. She's like, could things be the way they are because you are the way you are? And the short answer to that is yes. Things are the way they are because you are the way that you are. If you want to elevate your life, elevate the quality of your thoughts. And if this is not um, aspire to perspire to neglect all those things, no. If a trial is that, you know, there are some things that trials will convince you. What do you think about? Some people say, oh, Lady Buddha, you can't say this. Nigeria is this, Nigeria is that. Let me tell you, there are some thoughts I don't think about my nation today. I just don't. There are some things I don't say about my leaders today. And it does not mean that I am pro any one of my leaders or not. That's a separate conversation that's not from the, for this room. What it is, is that so long as I am living here in this land, I will enjoy a peaceful existence in this land. Nigeria and I will not fight ourselves. Will I experience some frustrations here and there? Yes, I will. But ultimately, as long as I am here, Nigeria will favor me and mine. It will. It's just what I fundamentally believe. I'm not telling you a wish list. I fundamentally believe it. Genuinely to the core of my being, I believe it. And it's what I experience. What do you think about? What do you journal? Somebody was saying, was speaking to a therapist once, and the person says, look, everything looks so dark. And the therapist said, each day, just find three moments of light. Can I challenge you? Each day, just find three moments of light. Your moments of light could be like, I had a yummy lunch. Like after this meet, after this, I have another meeting. But uh, thankfully, it's a virtual meeting. I'm going to be eating jollof rice in that meeting. So I'm going to have, my, one of my moments of light today is that jollof rice that's waiting for me. You know, with some prawns and some things inside. That's a moment of light. <laughs> Your moments of light could be like, I had a genuine moment of connection with someone today. I bought boiled groundnuts, I boiled, we boiled it again, I ate it and it was so yummy. I played with my niece today. I hugged someone today. I finished a task today. Every evening, look for three moments of light. You can keep it in a physical journal, you can put it on your phone, but be conscious to look for three moments of light. And the third thing that really helps is positive affirmations. So using positive statements to challenge your negative thoughts. The one thing that I didn't put on the slide that, but I find is very helpful in terms of positive thinking is limit what you watch. So for some of you, that means that you're going to have to log off Instagram for this weekend. You're going to have to mute TikTok for this weekend. You're going to have to get out of Snapchat for this weekend. For some of you, you're going to have to stop watching the news for a few weeks. You can't have positive thoughts if all you're surrounded with is negativity, calamity, comparison, and whatnot. It's not possible. 
All right? Okay. And then, the final pillar I want to share is on problem solving. And I'll share four things. I want you to define the problem. What am I trying to fix? What am I trying to fix? What am I trying to become? What am I trying to do? Define the problem. Second big thing is find how to brainstorm solutions. Generate multiple possible solutions as, as often as possible. Third is now assess the, the solutions that are brought. Assess the pros of it. Assess the cons of it. Ask yourself those questions. And then the fourth is take action. You have to have a very strong action bias as a leader. Don't just be content with acquiring knowledge. Oh, I came here. Oh, my goodness. Hey, oh, wow. The session here hey, was good. What are you going to do in your life? What are you going to implement in your life? One thing. I don't need three. I don't need five. I don't need seven. One thing you're going to implement in your life in the area of adaptability and resilience. Those are the type of questions you should be asking. Time management. Okay, you've done the session. Great job. What is one thing you can implement starting immediately to grow in this area of what it is that you've just learned? Okay. I think one last thing, and this one that I wanted to share with you is really um, a it's a man, it's a mantra slash a manifesto that speaks to resilience, and I love it very much. I'm going to share. I'm going to read it out, and uh, I think you have you you have the slide, so you can also you know, record it if you want, voice print it if you want. It's not original to me, so you can do whatever. And it says, I will not give in to sadness. Me, I always like adding things. I will not give in to sadness, even on days where there are things to be sad about. I will not let my thoughts control the way I feel, but I will direct my thoughts and also direct my words. I will never, ever, ever give up. I will stay positive and work on the solution. If the first solution doesn't work, I will work on it again. My life is great with all the positive and negative things in it. I'm not trying to divorce the negative from the positive. No, good, bad, ugly, my life is good, it's enjoyable. It is it's, it's sweet, it's beautiful. That is the story of what you should be telling yourself each day. I always allow myself to be happy no matter what. This is such a, your emotions or your mood, your temperament, when you get this thing of adaptability and, and um, resilience, your temperament is not fixated on what is going on. Ah, they gave me sweet today, so I'm happy. They didn't give me sweet tomorrow, so I'm sad. No. That is a lower level way of living. And segue into the fourth point. I will always, I, I will allow myself to be happy no matter what. No matter what. And the fifth one is fifth, well, tenth, whatever. I am enough and I am complete. You are enough and you are complete. And you can say this periodically over and over again um, to just really land this message in your heart and your mind of what resilience is, how it is that you show up and what it is that you can do. Okay. And on this note, I think you can take any questions. I think I have two minutes um, to the or three minutes to the end of my time. So if you have any comments, any questions, um, please let me know. Or if you want to share your light bulb moments with me, Please, please do so as well. Thank you.